What do you see when you look at this? The crucifix. When we look at what happened in the Passion, it can look intensely, gravely evil. It can look as if Satan has prevailed. We know, according to Scripture, it was so bad, even the sun went into eclipse, hiding its light. So bad, even the earth convulsed in earthquake. And we can be tempted at times to think darkness is going to have the last word here. You know, that we're stuck with this forever. Look at the cross. I mean, does that look like the Son of God? To our eyes, this can look like just a really terrible, unfortunate tragedy. The cutting down of the Lord in the prime of his life. Bloodied, marred, stripped naked, humiliated. How could we bear to look, as we read in Scripture, like a lamb led to the slaughter, abandoned? And we hear one of the thieves cry out, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. And we might be tempted to think, with the thief, yes, Lord, why are you letting this happen to you? This is God? Really? Are you sure about that? But this is the whole reason Jesus came. You may remember from last Sunday, my homily for Palm Sunday mentioned how it's important for us to remember that Jesus is in charge this whole time, that Jesus knows exactly what he is doing. That these events don't just happen to Jesus, but he lets them happen. See, by Jesus' deliberate judgment, his action, he is claiming his kingdom here. And no longer will the powers of evil, sin, death, Satan, rule or have dominion. Jesus has come to wage war against these powers. And there have been, I'd say, three ways in, in which the tradition has tried to explain um, in the last 2,000 years of the church, three ways to understand the passion of our Lord, to, to understand the cross, the reason for Christ's suffering and death and why he was nailed to the cross, the events of this day. The first is this. The first would be that God loves us so much. You know, right from John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Uh, even in pop culture, uh, look at Tim Tebow with the uh, eye black, you know, uh, when he was playing with John 3.16. And then the people in the stands often with just John 3.16 on, on the posters. So everybody knows this. The reason for Christ's suffering and death uh, was that God loved us so much. That's one understanding of the passion, of Jesus coming and dying for us. The second, then, would be that Jesus came to atone for our sins. Atone. How God wins back our souls. Why? Because in justice, we deserve not God. In justice, if we say, I don't want you, God, we deserve not to get God. So in justice, we're on trial. We're guilty since the fall. And yet the Son of God comes and takes our place and wins back our souls. And then instead of me and you suffering, Jesus becomes the, the vicarious atonement for us, the one who suffers in, in my place and in your place, the one who takes our sin and takes it all into himself as the sacrificial lamb, as Father pointed out last night in his homily, the Passover lamb. Jesus is there for me, substituting for me and for you. And that death then would die, and, and then Jesus would triumph over that. And those are the first two common interpretations of the cross, of Jesus' crucifixion, and, and these are all correct. But the cross is not only a sign of, I guess, you know, oh my gosh, that's how much you love me, God. You win back my soul. These can just render Jesus as kind. Jesus is kind. Thanks be to God. <laughs> but thank God, Jesus is more than kind. He's a warrior. He's come to wage war. And this is a third way we can understand the cross of our Lord, his passion. That was really popular with the church fathers. These were the guys around in the first centuries after Christ. 
the interpretation that Christ came to wage war, that he is a warrior. That from the Garden of Gethsemane last night, as we recalled, when the soldiers came to arrest him, already he was showing himself as a warrior, someone in battle. Before then, too, to be sure, but, but really then, beginning at, at his betrayal, and then when he was arrested in the garden, handed over. You know, we see that Jesus is chained, he, he chained he's brought in, into the praetorium, he's questioned, scourged, beat, yelled at, mocked, lied about, and then he carries the cross, he's nailed to that cross, bloody, tortured. And, and this whole time, it's as if the church fathers would say Jesus is a warrior, as someone in battle. He's, he's engaging the enemy. That he's saying, bring it. You might have seen some of these pregame rituals of some of the, the great athletes. I was thinking of LeBron James' chalk toss. I'm not, well, okay, I'll try to impersonate it. He grabs a handful of, of chalk, tosses it into the air, and watch it, watches it disappear. I know LeBron is kind of a, dis, a divisive figure, but uh, he does this as a lot of a lot of athletes as if to say, game on, bring it. And Jesus is drawing the prey, which is Satan, the powers of death, sin, and hell. You know, that he's drawing the prey to himself and saying, bring it. Who here is a hunter? Oh, there he is, my dad, okay. <laughs> what do hunters do? Before they go out. Camo, you know? Try to disguise themselves, right? Camo, sometimes even, uh, you know, the, the stuff to try to take off your, your own scent. Hunters do these things because they want to draw the deer closer to them, the prey as it is. And in a similar way, Jesus is doing that. He's trying to draw the enemy closer until ultimately, as he's hanging from the cross, he's got him. And you see, the enemy thinks that he's won because he sees Christ nailed to the cross but it's as though Christ is in disguise there. God is in disguise as man, as you and me, lowly man. And God looks like you and me. You know about ambush predators like spiders, snakes, other scary uh, creatures. You know, they, they lie still in disguise, camouflage with their surroundings until you know, they pounce on their prey. Again, that's kind of what Jesus is doing. In his passion, Jesus is disguising more and more and more his divinity, the fact that he is God. He's clearly intrigued the heck out of Satan here. You know, it's not like Satan doesn't know this is the Son of God. As we often hear in the, in the scriptures, the, the demons recognize this as the Son of God often before man does. He's not confused about that, Satan. But he doesn't expect to see God like this. So that all of a sudden, at this moment in his life, then what do we see? We see Jesus covered with blood, stripped naked. By the way, Jesus doesn't have a loincloth on in the crucifixion. Okay? Uh, in reality, the, the one crucified would have been stripped completely naked. The purpose to humiliate them. His skin ripped to shreds, crowned with thorns. You know, he's been laughed at, mocked, spit on. The enemy's coming closer to him the whole time. And the Lord is trying to draw him near. You know, remember, again, this isn't happening to Jesus. You can't nail God to a cross. You know, where are you going to get nails big enough to nail God to the cross? The only way you can get God on the cross is God's got to will it. And why is he willing to be there? Because he wants to be. He wants to do this. You can imagine the enemy thinking, you're about to be mine. You've done some extraordinary things before now, but no one escapes death. 
and you are clearly dying. You are all alone, and I am going to have you. And the Lord wants that to happen. He wants to be swallowed, if you will, so that he can explode the kingdom of death from within. You might know Matt Marr's song, Christ is Risen. Don't go try to listen to it today. Wait until Sunday. In the song, we hear that Christ tramples death by death. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He tramples death by dying. Why? Because God can't die. God can't die. So he takes a human nature so that he can die. That death can get swallowed by death so that he can go into hell and liberate it. And we know that God, Christ, is going to win. And he does. He triumphs over sin and death. So it can be helpful for us to think about these different interpretations or purposes for the crucifixion, the Lord's passion. And I I find this last one to be very helpful. As the one who's going to war, you know, that he's drawn the prey closer to himself, that he's engaging the enemy ultimately because you and I matter to him so much. That he loves us so much. And he's destroying the kingdom of darkness, the reign of sin and death liberating us and saving us, saving our souls because he wants his kingdom to reign in our world and in our hearts. And this is what we commemorate today, Christ's victory on the cross, which starts with this, with the crucifixion, because it is a victory, the victory that we will celebrate, the victory that's won on Easter Sunday by his triumph over sin and death when he's raised from the dead. So, so Good Friday and Easter Sunday are like a package deal, you could say. We need both these days, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We need Easter, we need resilience, we need light, goodness, and ultimately know that we're going to triumph. But we need Good Friday too, to remind us that we have a God who can change evil into good, who can transform Good Friday into Easter Sunday, to show us There is purpose in our suffering. That all of this isn't for naught. That this has meaning. Not only for Christ, but for us forever. And Jesus teaches us that from the cross. He didn't promise he'd take the cross away. He said, if you carry it with me, there will be life. In fact, as Christians, we know that we see our our whole lives as, as helping Christ to carry his cross as Simon of Cyrene does. Jesus has come to take back his creation and rescue us from a tyrant. That's what it means to be redeemed, to be liberated. That we are no longer under the power of sin and death. Brothers and sisters, before the incarnation of, of Christ, his death, his resurrection, his ascent into heaven, the descent of the Holy Spirit, we had no chance We had no chance against the powers of sin and death. Now we have a chance. But to be clear, this doesn't mean the battle is over. I mean, just look around. You know, this isn't like an all clear. There is a battle still. We know that the war, the battle will finally be over when Jesus returns and destroys every rule, every principality and power and delivers his kingdom to the Father. So it's not over, but what it is, is a message now that there's actually a chance for you and for me. There's hope, by God's grace. Because now someone who is in us is greater than the one who's against us. Because we have inside of us the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Like, that's insane. (laughs) That we can overcome those dominions which have previously held us down. That we can escape the tyranny of sin and addiction and not least, no longer be held down by the fear of death. That's what the Lord wants to do in our lives.
Now all that's waiting is our response.